Uh, I don't have any new announcements today. Um, there's a homework that's due tomorrow. Um, of course, you get to use the late day if you feel like uh, you can't get it done by tomorrow. Um, and you know, the, this homework is either very easy or it's not. Um, but it's hopefully making you think. Uh, and it's a set of, think of it as a set of puzzles that you need to solve. Um, uh, the good news, as you may have noticed, if you've already started, is there's no programming. No. Um, I know. Um, um, use the office hours. Speaking of office hours, uh, you'll have two office hours tomorrow because we didn't have one yesterday. Uh, I think there's a message on Canvas already. If not, there should be one at some point. And uh, another reminder was about a project deadline that uh, uh, Project Milestone 2 is uh, due on the 4th of April. We spoke about this before, so I won't go into this stuff. Any questions about the homework? Did you have a question? Any questions about the homework? Yes. For a finite concept class, is that in Firefox there's a finite number of inputs? Um, not necessarily. What it does imply, imply, what it implies is there are a finite number of functions in that set. It could be an infinite number of inputs, but somehow if you construct a, only a finite number of functions, it's good. Other questions? There were a lot of uh, questions about the decision tree thing on Piazza. Hopefully, that's uh, there's a discussion on that, right? Um, and uh, one thing that I find a little bit surprising about this uh, iteration of the class is usually the question that most people find the most confusing is the ones involving VC dimension. Um, okay, I see one head nodding, so I'm happy. Uh, that's good. Uh, it, because the VC dimension part of the question tends to be a little bit tricky, not because it's difficult, but because it's... Uh, yeah, but because... Uh, it, it's a little intricate. So you need to uh, uh, step through many different things. A few sort of high level points to keep in mind uh, with any VC dimension proof. Anytime you're asked to prove that VC dimension is some number, really you need to write two proofs. One proof that says the VC dimension is greater than or equal to that number. The other one that says the VC dimension is strictly less than that number plus one. So for instance, in your homework, I ask you to prove that the VC dimension of uh, Axis aligned rectangle is four. That really requires two proofs. One that says the VC dimension is at least four. The other one that says VC dimension is strictly less than five. For the at least part, you need to show that you can just present one configuration of points um, where uh, no matter how you label them, every possible labeling is allowed uh, according to this con according to this concept class. So the thing that means that the thing that gets fixed is uh, the, the configuration and you get to pick whatever you want, how the points are laid out. The thing that you need to enumerate exhaustively is all possible labelings. The other side for the upper bound where you show that the VC dimension is less than five, the thing that's fixed uh, is the function class. What you need to enumerate exhaustively is all possible are ways to arrange the points. So no matter how the points are arranged, in this case, on the plane, there is something, some rectangle that cannot cover only the positives. So that means, no matter how it's arranged, you might, you should produce a way to label those points. So the thing that you need to produce is, given the arrangement of the point, how do you label? And you need to show that you are uh, you are exhausting all possible arrangements. This, even as I'm speaking, this seems exhausting um, because it's a little bit intricate. So I encourage you to kind of think through it step by step rather than just um, break it down into pieces. When you're doing the lower bound, just think about the lower bound. And when you're doing the upper bound, just think about the upper bound. It becomes a uh, little tedious. Yes. How can we like be sure that we cover all sets of like durations of points when proving the upper bound of these things? That's part of the proof. Mm -hmm. um, or it's an argument that says that, you know, here, consider these sets of this, this type of arrangement of points and consider this other type of arrangement of points. I'm just making things up here. And then you argue, no matter how five points are 
laid out on a plane, they must fit into one of these two things. That's part of the argument. It's, it's not, how can, it's the, the usual answer for how can you be sure that some mathematical property holds is prove it. Uh, in this case, it's just a, you might have to um, uh, explicitly argue that other than what you have described, no other configuration is possible. Yes. When there's proving something can, do we just have to show an example of it not working? Or do we have to show that no matter what, it will never work? No matter what, what? No matter. We're given the five points, we are trying to say that it can never, we can never put a square. Or to never put a rectangle. Yeah, but it's you know it's not given the five points. You're not given the five points. You know, you could have five points that look like this. You could have five points that look like this. You could have five points that look like this. Or like this. Or maybe these five points. There are an infinite number of five points. You don't get to pick one of them and say, say that it doesn't work. You need to have an argument about every possible way in which five points can be uh, uh, placed on the plane. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, uh, no. Just as an example, notice here. Hopefully, you you agree with me that there's nothing that makes. Uh, oh, well, there's these five and these five and these five are basically the same thing. Mm -hmm. And the reason they are the same thing is any argument you use for one of them applies for the other one. That's how I'm uh, I'm thinking. I'm asking you to think about something. Else. This is not the answer. This is just an example. Uh, can we reduce like our like arguments from like the lower bound? <laughs> if you can, if it makes if it makes sense, you can. Um, not I mean it's not like you're, it's not like you're not allowed to use. Mathematically true points from somewhere else. Is it kind of expected that including the upper bound, we're going to have more of a logical argument than like throw it in? Yeah, the yes, the that's right. That's, that's exactly right. Uh, for the lower bound, you just need to show that something it works. It's a constructive proof. The way you show that it works is by presenting that function. So it's easy. Um, for the upper bound, you have to reason it out a bit. There are a couple of questions here on uh, um, Zoom. For the answer, can we show that the set of points, ah, for the answer, can we show the set of points that are shattered slash not shattered instead of all the possibilities? So for the lower bound, it's enough to show a set of points that are shattered. For the upper bound, you need to show no, no matter how the points are on the plane, they cannot be shattered. So you, you can't just, a, a common mistake with the upper bound is people present one set of points and say, this cannot be shattered, so it won't work. It's not it's sufficient to show one set of points that cannot be shattered. It's important to show that no set of points can be shattered. Uh, another question, if you went the contradiction route, do you still need to show both cases? That's a good question. Um, even in the contradiction case, you have to consider both cases because uh, to show that uh, uh, it, it depends. I, I don't know if you're talking about this particular example, but uh, I would I would say it's easier to do this without without using contradiction. But uh, even with the contradiction, you may have to argue both cases. I have to think this through. Maybe we can uh, discuss this uh, after class if you want. Any questions? Any other questions? Yes. Uh, for a, a function, you already know, use the inductor, the assign function. Could, could we uh, assume by default a sign zero is positive? Yes. Uh, the convention, not just in machine learning, but in general, is the sign function is one if the uh, its input is greater than or equal to zero. Other questions? Homework? Okay. So, if there are no questions, we're going to jump back into support vector machines. In the last lecture, we looked at uh, we uh, introduced to SVMs, and uh, the story so far was that if we have a lower Vichy dimension, it leads to better generalization. 
And Rafmi comes around and says, for linear classifiers, the one way of reducing the VC dimension is to find a classifier that has a larger margin, because larger margin leads to lower VC dimension, which leads to better generalization. And the thing that we saw in the last lecture in some detail was for the separable case, the, the maximizing the margin is equivalent to finding a set of weights, the, uh, finding a weight vector of W that minimizes the norm of W, the squared norm of W actually, W not to W, such that for every example in the training data, Y W transpose X is at least one. And we looked at uh, a pictorial, uh, you know, there are a few ways in which we uh, work through this, but the you know you can write this uh, in math as this optimization problem. So we we seek to minimize half W transpose W. That's exactly the same as that that has the effect of maximizing the margin. But if you minimize W transpose W in an unconstrained way, what's the minimum value? Let's forget vectors. Let's say that I have some x which is a real number. And I want to minimize this value by searching over all possible values of x. What is the minimum value of x, uh, of x squared? Zero. zero. So the same thing holds for w trans, and which x leads to x squared being zero? Zero. zero. So in the unconstrained case, if this were not there, zero. then the minimum of w transpose w is just a zero vector, mm -hmm. is the vector that contains all zeros. Mm -hmm. That's not what we want, because in deriving this, we also had this whole uh, argument about uh, the point that is closest, that defines the margin, should have y w transpose x equals one. Which means for every example indexed by i, so we have an xi yi, the value of y times w transpose xi should be greater than one, at least one. And subject to this constraint, we want to find the minimum value of W transpose W. This, this uh, version of the optimization problem is called the hard SVM. We saw this in the last lecture. And uh, we also saw that this is a problem because it does not work when your data is not linearly separable. In particular, this constraint here, that there must be a single weight vector that makes Y W transpose X greater than one for every single example means that the data set is linearly separable because y w transpose x then will be positive. So every example is correctly classified by that particular weight vector. Not all data sets are linearly separable. So this only works for a linearly separable data set. In, and if your data is not linearly separable, this becomes, this is an infeasible optimization problem and there is no solution. It's not that the solution is zero. It, the, in this case, the solution does not exist if the data set is not linearly separate because of that constraint there. And this is where we left things off. Any questions about uh, this here? Yeah, so if not, we're going to now consider, we, we're going to look at how to fix this problem. Um, how do we handle the case when the data is not linearly separable? And I mentioned uh, the uh, a hint for how we can address this in the last lecture. The idea is that we allow some examples to break into the margin. So this example here defines the margin, the plus, and these three minuses together, any of them, define the margin. And notice that we have uh, constructed the weight vector, the separator with the, between the pluses and minuses that ignores the impact of these two highlighted points. If this is the margin, if this distance here is the margin, then that plus is clearly inside the margin. The minus, if this line defines the margin, all the minuses should be here this minus has traveled all the way there in the wrong direction. So it's clearly broken into the margin. So we are allowing examples to break into the margin. Now, the question is how do we know which example we're going to allow to break into the margin and we'll look at that in a bit. But uh, imagine that we were able to ignore those examples. Then we, we can compute, we can just train the old uh, SVM, we can get a large margin classifier and life is good. 
So let's uh, think about this a little bit more uh, in detail. This example here, let's first look at uh, this plus. The constraint that we had is y w transpose x should be greater than or equal to 1 for every example that we are currently entertaining. So we are not entertaining the uh, examples that are circled. So this plus here, for up to here, this is uh, assuming that uh, we have a unit weight vector, that distance is one, Th which means this distance is something less than one. Let's zoom in here. If this gap here is one, then this gap is something less than one. So it is what? It is one minus whatever this thing here is, right? Let's call that. Uh, I'm going to write a squiggle and I'm going to say it's a Greek letter Xi because I don't know how to write that Greek letter. Eventually I'll typeset it and you'll see how, how it gets written and maybe you'll know how to write it. Um, so the, this, this quantity is called a slack. We are allowing this example to not to have a slack equal to this quantity here. Similarly, for the negatives, if this gap here is one, this example is on the wrong side by that much. And this is its slack. So how, how far are we allowing the example to break into the margin? So for every example, we allow it to break into the margin and assign a certain slack. And then we are going to try to say, we don't want all the examples to break into the margin by controlling the amount of slack. Let's, uh, let's formalize this. This was our hard SVM. Um, the objective is minimize half W transpose W such that in the example, uh, y, for every example, Y W transpose X is greater than or equal to one. We'll introduce one slack variable, psi i, for every example. And instead of requiring Y W transpose X to be greater than one, we're going to say Y W transpose X should be greater than one minus the slack. As we saw in that example there, we are allowing it to break in by that much. And of course, all the slacks are positive. Okay, if we just throw this in, we just put a, a minus psi i here. The problem is, first of all, we're going to optimize over all the slacks. So we're going to treat that as something that we're going to consider. What, what could happen with this if we uh, just solve this optimization problem as it is right now? If we allow examples to break into the margin and try to find the uh, solve the problem where we are minimizing the norm of W. Yes. Uh, so if you have like the case where we can't separate all the data, we only make the margin smaller. We've not we've not made the margin smaller, we've actually made the margin bigger. Yeah. By allowing some variables to some examples to break into the margin, we are ignoring it essentially to define the margin so the margin can get bigger and bigger. Um, if uh, psi i uh, is a positive value, uh -huh. we would just start uh, minimizing that we uh, we can't place w to like a vector in there to correctly classify all these things. Yes, but let's make this even more problematic. The way to interpret optimization problems is think of this the optimizer is a machine whose only goal is to make is is to make this as small as possible and those constraints are constraining it preventing it from making it smaller what is the smallest value of w not zero zero so the question to think about is is there a value of w and psi that makes the, uh, that allows that optimizer to get a zero you're nodding your head, we won't yes. answer. You just have W zero and psi one that keeps our Um, Not necessarily, because if psi is one, then we still have Y W of X is greater than or equal to zero. But if, if w oh yeah, if W is zero, that was. Yes. Let me give you, a, mm -hmm. you're absolutely right. If W is zero and all the size are one, mm -hmm. then we are getting the minimum possible value of W transpose W. Mathematically, the minimum possible value is zero. Mm -hmm. So we got that. And all the constraints are satisfied. Mm -hmm. Another extreme here is if W is zero and all the size are infinite. 
y w transpose x can be anything and it's going to be greater than negative infinity. Could be anything, might as well make it zero. Yes. So is there a different size? Yes. Uh, there is a, there's an, uh, I, this, the font might be small, but psi i, psi is indexed by i. Every example has its own slack wave. The reason we have, the, the, the problem with this is we allow the slacks to grow to be whatever it can be. There is no constraint on the slack other than the fact that it should be positive. Does this make sense? So this is not the final answer, but do you recognize the problem here? So how do we address it? But before that, um, just a quick, uh, the, the, the intuition here is each slack variable allows its corresponding example to break into the margin. And of course, if sl the slack is zero, then the example is either on the margin or on the other side of the margin, on the correct side of the margin. Yes. So you just said you have two extreme cases. So one extreme case is the uh, W is above zero. Oh, what's the other extreme? The, there is, that's not the other, there's no other extreme. This is it. This is one extreme. This is only the one extreme. Yeah, yeah. For now, this is the only extreme. Mm -hmm. Then we'll come to another extreme later. So the problem is if you allow, if you just put a psi i here and say, I need to minimize one minus psi y w transpose, sorry, minimize w transpose w, such that y w transpose x is greater than or equal to one minus psi i, this optimizer will try to cheat you and say, set all the size to one or two or any large number more than one and make the w's all zero and we are done. So it, it, what does it mean to say that the w's are all zero? If the, w, if the weight vector is zero, a new example will come in. If, and what, what will the prediction for that new example be? It's a sign of w transpose x, the sign of zero, which is one. So if we get a weight vector which is all zeros, Future examples will all be labeled as possible. Clearly, that's not a good classifier. So, how do we fix it? The problem here is we are allowing the, the optimizer to pick whatever value of psi it wants. And that's not good. We need somehow, we need to control its ability to choose psi. And this control gives us a full uh, SVM. What you do is First of all, we have the same thing where instead of y w transpose x greater than one, we have it to be greater than one minus psi i. So we allow examples to break into the margin. But in addition, we also have this extra term in the objective that says, in addition to making w transpose w as small as possible, also make the size, the sum of all the psi small. Don't make them all equal to one or infinity or something. Add some control on how big the size can go. And that way, you are uh, you, you prevent this uh, the, the the learner from setting all the w's to zero, or setting all the w's to be some very small number. Let's uh, the other than this shaded thing and the circle thing, the only extra part in the of, of, uh, optimization is this each psi i should be positive. Let's uh, interpret this optimization problem a little bit more. And I'm calling this the soft SVM. Just to uh, uh, distinguish it from the hard SVM, it's really just SVM. This is what people uh, think uh, mean when they say support vector machines. We, this optimization problem here. What we have here is we have an optimization problem that says minimize the value of W transpose W or half W transpose W. That's equivalent to say maximize the margin. Why? Because of all the, the story involved in Lapland. In addition to that, Minimize the total slack. By minimizing the total slack, we are allowed, we are asking the model, don't allow all the examples to break into the margin. Um, by slack, there's a question on slack. By slack variable, do I mean that the value falls through the, the, the value that falls through the margin? It, by yes, the slack variable decides. So if you have a hyperplane here or a line here, and let's say this defines the margin. And there's an example here. This quantity is the slack. That's the psi i. So we want uh, y w transpose x should to be greater than this is one minus psi i. That gap here. 
So we are asking that in addition to maximizing the margin, we should also minimize the protein flag so that we don't allow all examples to break into the margin. And then there are these constraints, but there's an extra thing here, C. C is the trade-off parameter that says that, uh, that we get to pick. It's a hyperparameter that we get to pick that says, how important are these two uh, things with relative to each other? For example, if C equals infinity, then we say, minimize the value of infinite times the sum of the slacks, where the slack, the each slack is positive. If C is infinity, the only non-infinite value for that objective is going to be where uh, the slacks are all zero. Which means if the slacks are all zero, the data has to be linearly separable because if this becomes zero, this goes away, then for every example, y double tau of x should be positive, greater than one. So if C is very, very large, we are asking the model to overfit the data. If C is zero, then we are saying, you know, that term does not matter. This whole thing does not really matter. Find the weight vector that makes just W transpose W as close to zero as possible. In fact, equal to zero. This situation is the exact opposite of overfitting. It's called underfitting. It's underfitting because in, in contrast to overfitting where every training example has to be perfectly classified, in underfitting, in the extreme case, we are essentially ignoring all the training data and saying the weight vector is zero. So these are the two extreme cases here. Of course, neither of these extremes are good, so we have a hyperparameter that we use uh, cross-validation to find. Any questions about this? This object, this optimization problem is, it looks ugly, but uh, in fact, it's actually rather, uh, if you build it up from first principles, it's not particularly difficult. Yes. Why do you need the psi? If psi is not positive, then what you might end up hap what what might end up happening is you're saying allow it's it's about that the other side, right? It's saying that for this example, this quantity is psi, but we don't care. We just need it to be on one side of the market. So uh, we introduce AI just for those uh, uh, variables that labels that we are you know, that are not uh, uh, that are on the wrong side of the margin that are inside the margin or on the wrong side of the hyperplane for those examples. Yes. In fact, if psi is are we can even after training this whole thing after running this optimizer, uh, you get this optimization problem is defined over both the w's and the psi. You can examine the value of the psi and you'll know which examples are well classified and which examples are on the wrong side. Well, if it's zero, then it's well separated. If it's non-zero, then it's in that side. So quickly recapping and taking stock of where we are. Um, we already saw all the way through here. For the separable case, the goal is simply maximize the minimize W transpose W such that Y W transpose X is positive. But that only for the separable case. For the general case, we introduce a flat variable, one flat variable for each example. And these flat variables serve uh, an important role. They allow, if its value is not zero, then it allows the corresponding example to violate the margin constraint. The margin constraint being this thing here. Any questions about this? This is an optimization problem. I've still not told you how this is solved. We'll be looking at how to solve this later on. I think later today. So we saw this optimization problem. I'm going to make this a little bit simpler with a few, uh, a little bit of algebra. Consider this constraint here. I'm going to rewrite that and say yi w transpose xi is greater than or equal to 1 minus psi i. And once again, I want to note that that squiggle is my version of psi. I just don't know how to write the Greek letter. This is exactly the same as saying psi i is greater than or equal to 1 minus y 
that will transpose x star. Right? I just move the psi to one side and and uh, y double transpose x to the other side. Now we also know that psi i is greater than or equal to zero. So now we have the fact that each slack variable should be greater than one minus y double transpose x, and it should also be greater than zero, which means it should be greater than the bigger of those two things. So I can combine both these constraints and say psi i is greater than or equal to max of zero comma Right? Now, here's something that I'm going to just say without explaining uh, in any detail. I can basically substitute psi i here. Let me remove some of the arrows that I'm looking. This psi i here, I can just plug the value that I just derived into this thing here and combine the, the change the objective and say, I want to minimize half W transpose W plus C times is sum over max, let me max of zero comma, one minus y w i w transpose x i. I just got rid of the psi. I substituted out the psi i with that right hand side of that thing. Notice that in this objective here, there is no psi. So the minimization problem is simply over the w. So we have simplified this into a much simpler uh, optimized well, it. It may not seem much simpler, but it's actually much simpler, it turns out. A much simpler optimization problem. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on this. You can kind of revisit this in the video, but um, there is a, a better typeset version of this here. The goal of the, the optimization problem on top that we derived is equivalent to this unconstrained optimization problem at the bottom. There are no constraints on the Ws. There are no constraints at all. So just say, minimize half W transpose W plus C times max 0, 1 minus Y I W transpose X R. And while this looks, this doesn't, may, this may not look immediately that good, it turns out that this form is actually, has a neat interpretation. And that's something I would like to spend some time on. The way to think about this is there are, two terms in this objective. The first term is half W transpose W. The second term is the other thing there. So let's just, this is the first term. And we have second term here. The first term says, as before, I would like to maximize the margin. Find the W that maximizes the margin. Why do I care about maximizing the margin? Because that gives me better generalization. The second term, as we will see in a bit, says over the data set, I want the second term is the total penalty for making mistakes on the data set. So look at the optimization problem. I seek to minimize over all W the norm of the weights plus the total penalty for making mistakes. It's a, it's a good idea to penalize models for making mistakes, to find classifiers that make fewer number of mistakes. That's what the second term says. The first term says, yeah, sure, it's important that you the model does not make mistakes, but at the same time, try to maximize the model. That way, you'll make fewer small number of mistakes and also generalize well in the future. In fact, we can, looking only at the thing inside the box, where, which is just about one example, xi, yi, we can consider, we can break it up into three cases. The first case is maybe the current, the, the weight vector that we have, that the optimizer, the learner is entertaining, correctly classifies this example. 
What does it mean to say that it correctly classifies that example? It means yi w transpose xi is greater than or equal to zero. Not only does it correctly classify the margin, the example, it also places that example outside the margin, which means it's not just greater than zero, it's actually greater than one. It could be on the margin, sure. It's on or outside the margin. So it's greater than equal to one. What does it mean that y i w transpose x i is greater than equal to one? That means zero is greater than equal to one minus y i w transpose x i. I just move y w transpose x to the other side. I just move this thing here. But if zero is greater than one minus y w transpose x, the value of max will be equal to zero. So if the example is correctly classified and is placed outside the margin, then the penalty for the weight vector from that example is zero. That seems reasonable because we want all as many examples to be put outside the margin as possible. The second case is if the example is incorrectly classified, which means y w transpose x is less than zero. If it's incorrectly classified, that means one minus y w transpose x is positive, is greater than zero. If one minus y w transpose x is greater than zero, this quantity will be equal to some number. It's going to be one minus y w transpose x, which is a positive number. So if the example is correctly classified and outside the margin, there's no penalty. If the example is incorrectly classified, then the penalty is 1 minus y w transpose x. There's still a third case. The example is correctly classified, but placed within the margin. So in that case, what we have is y i w transpose x i is greater than 0, but it's less than 1. In which case, 1 minus y i w transpose x i is greater than 0. I just move this quantity to this side and put and put a minus here. So what we are left with is if it's greater than zero, that means on this example, even though it's correctly classified, the the learner has to pay a penalty for choosing these weights. And how much is that penalty? It's exactly one minus y w transpose x. So there are three different regimes. If you want to think in terms of pictures, if you have, this is your current weight vector, let's say, and this is what defines the margin. You have example one here that belongs to this. Let's say it's a plus. This example, which is a plus, is here. And the third one is somewhere here. So the, there is no penalty on example number one. There is a penalty equal to one minus y w transpose x, which is basically this quantity here. No, sorry, not that. Which is this quantity here. How far is it from the which side of the margin uh, on the wrong side? And on example two, also there is this much penalty. And when I say this is the penalty, I'm defining effectively. Uh, an objective that the learner has to try to minimize. The goal of learning is to find a weight vector that has as small a penalty as possible. That way, all the examples will belong to category one. But at the same time, try to maximize the part because that term also needs to uh, be minimized here. The thing inside the box, um, the penalty for misclassification, it has a name. That thing is called the hinge loss function. The hinge loss function is a property, it's a penalty assigned to a weight vector for pro producing a certain, uh, for a particular labeled, labeled example. So it's a function of a example, labeled example x, y, and the weight vector, and it's defined to be this quantity here. The hinge loss, uh, before that, the support vector machine is a learning algorithm that tries to optimize the change loss, but subject to this uh, extra term there. That extra term is called a regularizer. So 
support vector machines are also called uh, sometimes they, you know, you, you, people don't necessarily say SVM, they might say, I'm trying to optimize the regularized change loss, which is just another way of saying I have an SVM. Any questions? There's a question. Why do the last, why, uh, why is it that the last two choices don't differ in terms of the penalty? That's the, the expression here is the same, but we'll see this in a minute. It turns out they do actually have different penalties because uh, uh, we will see this in a minute. They do actually have different penalties. This is actually the second loss function we are encountering. We've already seen a loss function. The first loss function we saw was for uh, was for linear regression, for regression. It's the uh, squared error. And we set up, we had the setup where learning was optimization problem where we wrote down, rather than defining a learning algorithm, we said, how should we penalize the, the, the a model for making mistakes? We had the squared loss that was for regression. Hinge loss is essentially behaving the same way, but for a binary classifier. Turns out that this is not the only loss for a binary classifier. We'll see at least two more. But uh, the story is essentially the same. You write down a loss function, in this case, the hinge loss that assigns a penalty for a model W uh, for operating in it, in however it does on an example. And the goal of learning would then be to find the model, the weight, that has the lowest penalty over a data set. Rather than saying penalty, we say loss. Let's uh, interpret the change loss a bit. Um, it's useful to plot this as a function of y w transpose x here. So I'm, pl I'm plotting, I'm showing two things in this plot. The red um, stuff there, the red line, the red curve uh, is called the zero one loss. And the way to think about it is what is y w transpose x? If y w transpose x is positive, then there's no mistake because y and w transpose x have the same sign. We saw this in perceptual. If y w transpose x is positive, which means on this side, there's no mistake. And on this side, there is a mistake. The zero one loss says if, if the sign of the y and w transpose x are uh, the same, then there's no penalty assigned to this weight vector for this example. If the signs are different, then the penalty equals one. If you add up the zero one losses over a training data, you are essentially adding one for every example that is misclassified. Because for every example, you will add, oh, this is a one here. This thing here is a one. For every example that where the Y and W transpose X have opposite signs, you will accumulate one. So what does it give you? The total zero one loss over a data set is what? The number of mistakes. It simply counts for every example that is a mistake, you add one. You do that over the entire data set, you're just accumulating the number of mistakes. So the zero one loss corresponds to the number of mistakes made by a classifier on the data set. And that if all you care about is accuracy, that's exactly the right thing to optimize. If all you care about is make as few mistakes as possible, then that is the only thing that matters. So you want to optimize the zero one loss. Unfortunately, it turns out optimizing the zero one loss is an intractable uh, mathematical problem. So we invent surrogates. One of those surrogates is this hinge loss. The hinge loss says it has these three regimes. Remember, on this side, there are no mistakes. But what the hinge loss says is it's okay. Uh, if your y w transpose x is more than one, then there's no penalty. If your YW transpose X is less than one on the wrong side, then the more bad it gets, the more the penalty grows. The farther you put the example on the wrong side of the hyperplane, the larger the penalty would be. This is an incentive for the model not to put examples on the wrong side of the, uh, of the hyperplane. But the interesting part is this region here. In that region, YW transpose X is clearly more than zero. And yet, it's less than one, so the hinge loss assigns a penalty, and that penalty is small comparatively. It's less than one, but it's non-zero 
And the goal is to force the model, force the learner to try not put, putting any examples here and move them outside where there's no benefit. The learner wants to find a weight vector where all examples are on the part uh, other end, part positive side. Questions? Yes. Uh -huh. uh, say that again. It's a, the larger you're talking about C there, right? Yes. If you penalize if C is larger, then we are then the margin gets um, more and more examples will be placed outside. So the margin might get smaller and smaller. Yes. So it is possible to overfit. And as a result, um, it, it, if overfitting is a bad thing, maybe it's not in this case, maybe the data set and the task is linearly separable, in which case it's okay. But it may lead to um, uh, poor generalization. It, notice that I'm I'm not claiming that it will lead to poor generalization because we don't know what the data set is, what the task is. Maybe it's linearly separable. Yes. Uh, so you say the zero one loss and the hinge loss. Can you uh, elaborate that because that's going to be an interesting discussion point. It's because, um, I mean, you're already doing like one half, uh, I don't think so, but you're planning on doing the brain design. Yes. So that requires that you know, differentiate it, yes. and zero one loss, you couldn't like, differentiate because it's not going to be as zero. Yes. The hinge loss, you can't really get the hinge because it's not it's not continuous at one. Well, it is continuous at one. At, it's not that. But it's not differentiable at one. It's not that it's not. It's not differentiable at one, and that's why we we'll need to look at a new way to think about calculus. Um, we'll have to look at this idea called the subgradient. We'll be looking at that. Well, I was hoping to get to that by now, but uh, we'll get there. But that's a that's a very good observation. Keep that thought in mind. We'll come there. Okay. So we have these uh, the hinge laws, and we have these three regimes. Um, actually, I've, rather than talking about how to optimize this, um, how to solve this optimization problem, I want to. In oh, there's a question. Um, correctly classified, but within the margin, is not the same as too close to the margin because the magnitude is not mentioned in the first case. Um, I. Don't understand the question, unfortunately. Um, could you uh, elaborate on that? While I think what you mean is, uh, wait, I I don't understand the question. So maybe you can elaborate on that. While while I wait, are there any other questions? Slide 69 versus slide 68. So in slide 68, aha. So here I say too close to the margin. And here I say correctly classified and within the margin. And uh, by that I mean, and there is the, the okay, I see. So I, I'm using these terms a little more loosely than is uh, ideal. In both cases, this should be. Not too close, but um, if they are if they are correct, but inside the margin, this should have been within the margin. Okay, so I want to generalize what we have seen here into something that's bigger than SVM or bigger than any one uh, learning algorithm that we've encountered. It's this general learning principle uh, that that drives essentially a good chunk of machine learning today. And this is the idea of risk minimization. And uh, the way it works is 
rather than me having to invent a new learning algorithm for every new hypothesis class that someone comes up with, rather than me you know, figuring out how to invent learning algorithms, let me just focus on the objective. The objective of learning is to somehow find a good model. In other words, the objective of, uh, the, is of learning is to find a model that has no error, for example, or as few mistakes as possible and generalize as well and such things. So what you do is you define the notion of loss that a model might make on any one training example. And by doing that, you can also calculate the total loss on the entire data. And the goal of learning, rather than have thinking of learning as like handcrafted algorithm uh, design, the goal of learning is simply an optimization problem where we want to find a hypothesis that has the lowest loss on the training data. But the problem with this, just this, is that uh, if you find a hypothesis that has the lowest loss on the training data, it might end up overfitting. It might end up being a very complex hypothesis in some form or another. So in addition to finding the lowest loss, you also want to penalize complexity. In the machine learning literature, the term that penalizes complexity is called a regularizer. So we want to minimize a regularizer, which is a term that penalizes complexity. At the same time, we also want to minimize the loss. If we have two things that we want to simultaneously minimize, might as well add them up. So the goal of learning now is to find a hypothesis that has the smallest value of regularizer plus the training loss. We've seen one instance of this already, which is the regularizer is simply um, half W transpose W, and the training loss is the total hinge loss on the training data. You could have added a regularizer, the same regularizer actually, also to least mean square regression, where the regularizer might be this, and the loss on the training data is simply the error, uh, the square error. This is the general learning principle. The goal of learning is to basically frame it as an optimization problem and let the people who invent optimization problems worry about it, whereas you can focus on your problem by inventing losses. The SVM objective function seen from, seen from this perspective, there are two terms here. The first term is the regularizer. The regularization term maximizes the margin. And equivalently, it minimizes, uh, sorry, minimizing the regularizer uh, maximizes the margin. Equivalently, by maximizing the margin, it increases generalization, or it allows for better generalization. Another way to think about it is, if you have two classifiers that are equal in terms of their behavior on the training data, pick the one that has the lower, uh, lower value of the regularizer. Turns out this is just one of the many regularizers that exist. We can replace this with other regularizers that also introduce similar preferences on, about generalization and have other interesting properties. One regularizer that might show up sometimes, is kind of not that popular, but uh, I've seen it, is instead of W transpose W, you, have, you replace this with just the sum of the absolute values of the weights. This is called the L1 regularizer. That's on one side. That's the regularizer. On the other side, we have the empirical loss. The empirical loss is simply the sum over the losses for every training example. In this case, for SVM, the empirical loss is the hinge loss. It penalizes weight vectors for making mistakes, in the, or not just mistakes, in case it, in fact, it even penalizes uh, weight vectors for uh, putting an example inside the margin. And it turns out this is just one of many losses that exist in the literature. Logistic regression, for example, can be seen as a loss, uh, a specific loss function. Perceptron can be seen as a specific loss function and so on. But the interesting part is there's a uh, new hyperparameter that we can now play. There's a trade-off parameter, C, that controls how important <coughs> each of these terms is in in the way in the domain that we are going to deploy this classifier. 
maybe we don't mind if uh, uh, we overfit the training data, in which case C can be high. Maybe we really, really don't want to overfit it. C can be low. Or maybe we don't really know anything. We're just going to use cross validation to find the best C among a set of C. One sort of a usual uh, search space for this hyperparameter tends to be in uh, in uh, powers of 10 or powers of 2, usually smaller powers of 10. So 10 power minus 1, 10 power minus 2. And in, in your homework 6, you'll be implementing an SVM and you'll be doing cross validation over these things. Any questions? Yes. You, you could do that. Absolutely. People, I mean, they all, that's just another uh, way in which this particular uh, uh, optimization problem tends to get written. I choose this because this is how I first was introduced to SVM. Um, also, this is how. A popular SVM library for with linear uh, in deriving for deriving the linear uh, uh, optimizer. This is the version that shows up. In fact, C is a command line flag for linear. Um, but I've seen versions where uh, this hyperparameter actually exists here. It's called a lambda, and this does not exist at all. You can think of lambda as one over C, or you could have lambda and one minus lambda. And they're all essentially, they behave the same. Yes. Yes. Sorry? Yeah. Uh, it penalizes complexity because it reduces, making it, allowing it to get larger, allows the VC dimension to get larger. And VC dimension is a measure of complexity. In the, in, that's the version, that's the, uh, justification for this particular regularity. 